morning, everybody. Thanks for coming this morning. Um, we're really excited to be able to uh, talk to you all about IIIF. And I thought we could begin by asking the same question that happened yesterday in the IIIF session. How many of you um, have implemented or have started looking at implementing IIIF in your institution? Ah. <laughs> now, you're, you're pulling my leg, right? <laughs> I'm going to start at the total beginning, just for those of you who don't, and just a very, very brief introduction uh, to what IIIF is. And then our four panelists are going to be talking really specifically about implementations that can, we hope, lower the barrier to participation for museums around the world. So, what is it? the International Image Interoperability Framework. And we always have to remember that it's triple IF and not I triple F or triple FI. People do get confused. But this is a really wonderful open source community of research libraries, museums, and you know, really growing out of the research library community, the triple IF specifications that have been around for about five, five or six years, but have really, um, really started getting some serious traction, even in museums, in the last two to three years, I'd say. So basically, IIIF consists of uh, some very well-defined APIs, and there are four at this point, the Image API, the Presentation API, the Authentication API, and the search API. We're going to mostly be focusing today on image API and um, presentation API. The other two are uh, for another time. So the image API is essentially a specification that allows you to enter a URL uh, to point to an image and control in that um, in that uh, URI, the appearance, rotation, size, crop, region, um, and quality of the image itself. And that did not work. Okay, <laughs> we won't go there again. Let's see if this one works. Um, okay, is Roel in the room? I don't see Roel in the room. This is a demonstration from the Princeton University Library, and as you can see, this is a, a you maybe can't see it because it's a Chinese uh, hand scroll, obviously a very, very high resolution image that in its natural state and in, in trying to see the whole thing, you really can't see the whole thing. But one of the first pieces that the image API does is allow for this really wonderful pan and zoom functionality, which works better on my computer than it does on this one. But um, yeah, you can really get closely uh, into this image, which of course is being delivered through a bunch of tiles from a very high resolution JP2 file. So we'll jump back out of there. And my job this morning is to introduce all of these lovely people who are going to give you much more detailed information about IIIF in museums, starting with Kate Blanche, who is at Design for Context now. Kate was at the Walters Museum for many years and is gonna talk, I think, about her experience at the Walters. Um, Daniel Sussman from the J. Paul Getty Museum, Dan Brennan from the Princeton University Art Museum, and Alan Newman from the National Gallery of Art. So Kate, this is you. Okay, perfect. Hi, everybody. Um, just a little background. Um, in August, um, I transitioned from the Walters Art Museum, where I was the systems manager for data and digital resources for many years. Um, sorry, I just need to fix that so I can see. Can you guys hear me? Um, so I joined the Design for Context team in August as data architect, um, and I am grateful to be able to continue to work with this community. Um, so I'm going to share my experience working um, 
working through the process of planning for a IIIF implementation that is framed around a dam. So how do we integrate IIIF into dams? Um, you know, I have to say, because of my transition from the Walters, the project, um, we, we got a great start, and we can frame out um, the partnership and um, motivations and approach for doing that. And I have some really basic, um, kind of empty examples to show. But um, I think in this, I think on this topic, the premise is really simple. It's kind of like, wait, I thought we already had an image server. So for those of us who have been going down the road with um, making investments into our, our dam systems as center points for organization and metadata storage and, um, and also web publishing and delivery, um, it is somewhat of an existential heartbreak to think that you have to stand up a second image server, sync everything over, add an, you know, have a second layer of processing on top of your dams. Um, so I will, with that, jump into it. Um, so what are the motivations for integrating IIIF into your dams? Um, and I will use the Walters as a case study. Technical infrastructure and staffing sometimes precludes the ability to stand up another implementation of a thing. Um, I think sometimes it's easier to make an argument uh, to uh, you know, extend existing systems or build functionality into existing systems if you are a, um, either a smaller, small to mid-sized organization or you just um, have lean technical resources or your huge IT department is just wired that way. You know, I mean, I think everyone has different reasons for wanting to integrate. There are also great reasons to have a completely standalone IIIF implementation. Um, so, uh, in my, you know, from my perspective, we really we had um, over 30 terabytes of um, of images that. Uh, you know, I really wanted to avoid having to shuttle to another place to undergo another l layer of processing. Um, you know, I think the interesting thing with dams that, you know, IIIF uh, celebrates to some, or facilitates to some extent is, you know, dams is um, a metadata channel. It's an image channel, so you're moving two streams. One is files, um, one is metadata, and, um, and then your dams, if you use it in that way, um, marries them together and provides a publishing or you know, web-enabled access. And um, you know, IIIF is a delivery mechanism, so, I mean, um, among other features, but um, you know, I think when I was trying to strategize about the Walter situation, um, it just seemed the only way we would be able to maintain it is if we could um, not have to recreate those image and data streams again for, um, for a second time, even though the IIIF delivery mechanism is fantastic. Um, so, Leveraging an existing dams definitely can shorten the on-ramp. Um, you know, the images, um, you can use the derivative sizes that your dams creates. Um, there's great metadata there sometimes. Um, the, uh, the interface for managing Im image access is there. One of the approaches that our um, developers suggested was that we could actually use the u user security permissions in our <laughs> dams to limit what we were publishing to IIIF, which was a, a cool built-in feature. Um, and you know, it, it's web-enabled, um, and if your dams has an API, then you're, um, you're halfway there. Um, so, and I will also just say, you know, I'm framing out a very base level implementation. So I would also say if you're gonna do any systems integration, just start simple, because it's a lot easier to build and scale up than it is to figure out how all these pieces are gonna work, especially when you're paying a developer to do this. So, um, so I just wanna touch 
around the um, the current landscape. So integrations are happening. They're not um, they're not widespread. Um, there's IIIF support for Luna. Um, the project I'm going to talk about is the resource space dams, which is an open source um, open source dams um, that. Um, has all sorts of active development going on around it. Um, and for the Walters, we actually, we partnered with Montala, who is the author of Resource Space. So um, we've, we had done several development projects with them for Resource Space. There's also a layer to this where um, digital collection management systems or like, you know, collection publishers are integrating IIIF support. And that's a totally fantastic way to um, utilize IIIF in your content management. It's, it, you know, doesn't place it at the level of kind of image management, but it ties it into the level of publishing, which is a, another really great strategy. Um, and I'll just, uh, you know, anchor this by saying like, the Walters was working towards like a level zero image API implementation. And, you know, that sounds laughable, but, you know, we had literally a budget of $8,000. Um, and I think, uh, I, th I think what's great about IIIF and the community is you can actually do a lot with that money, but our goals were, um, had to be focused for that amount of money. We had a basic public services use case, which means we really just wanted to serve up the derivative sizes that we had in our dams on our existing website through a IIIF compatible URI. Um, and, and that was like pretty much our goals. We kept it really simple. Um, so just a little bit about how it works. Um, you know, your, your dams provides users with a URL, and um, IIIF also streams images and metadata via a URL. So our first approach was um, to just set up a whole second image server and then find a way to script a sync between our dams and the IIIF server. Um, but in talking with the community, it was suggested that we just um, try to work with a developer to write to, or to code a shim that would take the URLs that our dams was, were creating and convert them into triple IF compatible URLs. So I walked around for two months talking about a shim and I didn't know what, <laughs> I've shimmed windows and doors, but um, <laughs> this was, and I was like, I, I know what this means. So, you know, just for those of you, just to like anchor the conversation, um, according to Wikipedia, a shim is a small library. I'm gonna read it, cause it's a great um, definition. The, um, uh, a shim is a small library that transparently intercepts API calls and changes the arguments passed, handles the operation itself, or redirects the operation elsewhere. So all of a sudden, instead of needing a second image server and a sync, we just needed a bridge, which is the miracle of programmers and code. Um, and it really, you know, initially we were we were thinking about needing twenty thousand dollars to do a, a triple IF implementation, and that includes hardware and um, contract developer support. And, and then we were able to scale it back to eight thousand. So, you know, I think for us that was it, it was a way to get get a start. Um, and there are. I'll point you to the um, IIIF Awesome group. There is a list of shims that are out there. So because this is community driven, um, there is code. Uh, there is code out there for reuse. Um, and given that the developers at Montala were able to um, basically take the URLs that Resource Base creates, um, apply the transformations to them, and generate IIIF um, compatible URLs. So where we, um, where we stopped active development was um, returning the manifest. So th obviously, um, and at, so at the top, you can see a very empty, sad manifest. And then at the bottom is all the data 
um, I just did a screenshot of the data that sinks into our dams from our collections management system. So one of the things that I want to underscore here is if you're thinking about a dams integration, it's time to take an honest look at if your dams is the center point for a lot of the activities that revolve around this. So do you have an integration with your collections management system? Totally an important factor to consider. Do you have data in your dams that support multiple images or sequencing of multiple images? Um, like, do you have enough in your dams right now that's worth leveraging? If you don't, you might just want to start a separate IIIF project. But like, this kind of hopes to demonstrate that we had all this collections um, metadata in there for great, rich manifest labels. We had a whole bunch of derivative sizes we wanted to repurpose. Um, and through a shim, it's easy to do. Um, I just wanted to end by saying um, our model for our basic public use case was to just include a triple IF link on our object detail pages for a triple IF compatible image. Um, really low aspiration with the hope to engage more completely with the features. Um, you know, a couple things we've learned so far. There's some technical stuff that we really do need to reframe on the project. There's some stuff that came out sideways in working with our developer. Um, you know, right now the URLs that are coming out of resource space apparently won't work in a Mirador viewer. Um, that's not cool. So I guess my, I mean, I share that to say that your partner, your developer partner, in this case we had a great relationship with our developer. I mean, you really need to work through some of this stuff with a, a, a vendor or a developer that you can trust. And you know, that's also to say your dams needs to be able to accept a customization or a plugin or an integration. Um, so you kind of have to have the open channels to make this work. It's not going to be a solution you can lay on top of every dams. Um, but I think together with developers, it's um, or even the when I say developers, I mean developers at our dams vendors that we can um, rally to create this type of integration. So um, so that's all. Um, thanks for letting me share. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Uh, I'm Dan Brennan. I'm an application developer at Princeton University Art Museum, where I've been working for the last uh, just about a year um, dealing with anything and everything having to do with all of our data and image services. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is how we very rapidly implemented IIIF, specifically the image API. Um, and some of the tools that we use to do that. Um, one of the most interesting things about IIIF to me is that it's relatively from an implementation standpoint, technology agnostic. Um, it can be as simple or as complicated as you want to make it. And so while I think this is great, it also lends to some confusion. And for anyone who was in sort of Tristan's uh, session yesterday about IIIF, a lot of the questions had to do with how do I get started and how do I really do this um, in a practical way? Um, so I'm gonna show you how we did it, which is not necessarily something that should be emulated or that will work for everyone, but it's one example. Um, so to kind of follow the, the course that Kate put out, what were the motivations for doing this um, for us? Um, the motivation for us is a pretty simple mission-driven one. Um, images of our collections are part of our institutional DNA. Literally, almost everything that we do um, has something to do with delivering an image of an object in our collection. Um, to the extent that we provide contextual information digitally. We write about our objects. We tell people stories about our objects. I think if we deny that people are coming to our platforms to look at our objects, we're fooling ourselves. Um, and so really for us, our, our implementation of IIIF has to do with how do we do this thing that's very core to our mission as a museum and as a digital work group within a museum, 
but better than the way that we've been doing it previously. And honestly, we've been doing this. This is a screen cap for our website. Um, this is not recent. This was taken, I think, about a year ago um, before we did anything having to do with the IIIF. And so what I'm trying to get across here is that we've been doing this from day one. And so it's not a new or novel concept for us. But what IIIF enables is a way for us to do it better and in a way that's more sustainable and extensible into other things that we might want to do in the future. Um, this is a quote that my mom used to always say, and I never knew where it was from until I Googled it fairly recently. <laughs> um, it's Maya Angelou, and it says, I did then what I knew now how to do. Now that I know better, I do better. And so again, this gets this notion of, let's take a thing that we do every day and do it in a better way. The third thing I want to talk about a little bit about IIIF is sort of, that was a motivator for us, is the benefit of the community that's built up around it. Um, we're very lucky at Princeton University where there's been a very active IIIF presence in the library from almost the start of the initiative. Um, and so we have resources that we can draw on, people we can talk to to help us out throughout this process. Um, what I've captured here in this, in this image is some of the documentation around the image API. And I put this up here for a very specific reason. is because for me as a developer, the benefit of community is not being able to say hi to someone who deals with IIIF. For me as a developer, the benefit is this is documentation that I don't have to write or maintain by myself. Um, this is not something that I've cus done custom that I am then responsible for. Um, and the pieces of this that I personally am concerned with I can put my voice into the conversation and you know, offer my thoughts on it. The pieces that I don't care about as much, I can let other people think about and deal with. Um, and that's, very, that's a thing that lifts a very heavy burden um, for a place like us where we have a very small development staff. So let's talk about what we've built at Princeton University Art Museum in the last year or so. Um, in October of 2016, um, which was about the time that I arrived, um, here was the landscape of our image services. And I use the term services loosely because really it wasn't a service in any sense. Um, Pre-cut images and derivatives serves as static content. This is Apache in front of a file directory. Um, no API for handling those images. You have to really know the exact path to what you're looking for. What you're looking for is one thing and one thing only and that's all you're going to get. Um, a very complicated caching system for delivering those images that caused all kinds of problems for our, for our downstream web services. Um, no image server infrastructure. Um, again, Apache in front of a file directory. If there are issues with that, there is no way to fix it other than taking it down, dealing with it, and putting it back up. Um, no tiled images. If you need a region of an image, you have to have a separate image for that specific region. Um, and you have to, again, know how to find it and where it lives. Um, and no scalability. If someone came to our website and started crawling all of our images and taking them one by one, everybody else has to get out of the way until they're done, essentially. Um, so, what, so what we've built at this point is a production-ready scaling IIIF compliant image server. This is Loris, um, for those of you familiar with the different servers. Um, an automated caching process that takes a lot of the load off of um, delivering the most requested images, of which we serve up 147 of that images. I would say about 500 of those account for 60% of requests. Um, 100, again, 147,000 tiled JPEG, JPEG 2000 files. And something I'm not going to talk about very much today, but is worth mentioning, are the 58,000 presentation manifests. These are on an object level which we were able to create once we implemented the image API because with a data service and the information we can get from the image API was relatively trivial. Um, and these are the nuts and bolts. The way that we did this, and this was a bit of an experiment for us because we had not gone into this realm very much, was by leveraging different Amazon cloud service technologies. Um, and there are a number of those involved in this process. And I'm going to breeze through these, but I'm happy to talk more of, after this presentation with anyone about them um, and sort of our experiences with them. Um, but more or less, so the image server, again, this is Loris. Um, the, this is an EC2 instance built on an Amazon machine image. What this essentially is, is a, an Amazon machine image is a template for a server. Um, so you define the criteria for the server, you define certain parameters that you want it to meet, 
Um, in the context of building something like Loris, which is a Python-based image server, um, being able to define those things before you have your server rather than retrofitting an existing server to do it um, is very useful. Um, in terms of scalability, we're using the elastic load balancer technology that Amazon offers um, with an auto scaling group. And so what this essentially means for us is that as demand goes up, we can spin up additional versions of the Amazon machine image um, and the sit behind a load balancer so that if we have a thousand requests, we have enough servers to meet a thousand requests. If we have 10,000, we have enough servers to meet 10,000 up to a point, and we're notified as those things happen. Um, our source images live in S3 storage. S3, I think a lot of people are probably familiar with. This is Amazon's storage technology. Um, we have server-side caching, which is in the Elastic Block store, rather than, as opposed to S3, which is um, sits elsewhere, within the Amazon realm, Elastic Block Store is attached locally to the server. And so, again, as I mentioned, we have repeated requests for a number of images. We get them, these pull from the Block Store rather than having to reach out to the S3 buckets. Um, for monitoring logs, we're using CloudWatch. Um, again, this speaks directly to the server and allows us to access the logs or anyone else from without having to actually go into that server and grab them. And our presentation manifests are also stored in S3 and then served through our REST API that sort of powers a lot of the things around the museum. Um, two other things worth mentioning. Um, the virtual private cloud, that is, the, again, a feature of Amazon Web Services. This allows us to have all of these things speak to each other while exposing only the pieces of it that need to be exposed publicly um, without having to establish very find discrete um, firewall rules across all of these different services that I just mentioned. And finally, the CloudFormation template. This, um, and I'll speak about this a little more in a second, this um, is a very interesting technology whereby you can take all of these things that I mentioned above, sort of spec them out via a JSON template, plug it in, and then have someone interactively spin up this entire layout sort of at a, in push button version. Um, and that looks kind of like this. Um, so you feed in your JSON template. Um, it, is it exposes a bunch of parameters to the end user. They decide what they want. They press deploy. And then you know five to eight minutes later, all of this stuff exists, sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so finally, some takeaways about all of that um, that I just kind of breezed through. Um, there are great things about this. Um, the rapid deployment enabled by the template is awesome. Um, again, if I need to spin up a development environment because I need to test something new, I can do that, do what I need to do, spin it back down when I'm satisfied. Um, the efficiency of scale. Um, if, if we find that we're delivering more images or we need to handle traffic that we've never handled before, we have, we have a template for doing that, basically. Um, the ever-expanding suite of Amazon services, they're constantly, constantly introducing new things, um, some of which are useful, some of which are not. The reusable elements, um, the things that we've learned doing this, we can now apply to other projects that we're working on. Um, again, the template handles our IIIF server setup. We also have an API-driven service that we prop up that also is built on that. Um, it's globally accessible. I can get into all of our services and monitor them from essentially anywhere I have a computer. I don't need to you know, SSH into something and then you know, call someone within Princeton IT to do so. Um, and the strong support network. Amazon Web Services are used um, across the world in all kinds of industries. Um, this is a technology that has a high level of adoption. And so if you're having an issue, chances are someone else has had it before. Um, the bad things about this, um, Amazon Web Services are incredibly complex. There's a whole language to it, um, sort of understanding where the different services live and what they do and how they speak to each other or don't speak to each other in some cases, um, takes a long time to figure out. And even though I deal with it all, all the time, I still don't you know, have some of that figured out. Money, this is expensive. Um, this stuff costs money. It's 12 o'clock. Um, <laughs> as, as, as these things scale, I mean, Amazon has figured out how to make this profitable for them. And so 
as these things expand and as our scale grows, we're going to end up paying for it. And it's not a linear curve. It's, a, you know, it's not linear. It's a curve. Um, you pay more the more you use. Um, it's subject to external factors, and this is the inverse of the ever-expanding suite of services. As Amazon introduces new things, they also take them away sometimes if people aren't using them as much as they want them to. And that's kind of a problem if you're using those things. Mm -hmm. And finally, once you're in, it's really hard to get out. If we were to step away from this at this point, it's a total rebuild of everything that we're doing to prop up IIIF. And then finally, um, just to conclude, the ugly. Um, in addition to all of that, Amazon isn't the most wonderful corporation in the world sometimes. Um, they're notoriously anti-worker. Um, anyone who is in, you know, sort of Peter Drucker's presentation yesterday about dams, sort of, I think he mentioned it a little bit too, it's like they, they know what they're doing and they're here to help you, but they're also here to get your money and that's their main concern. Um, and finally, um, just the hazard of increased centralization of internet services. Peter also sort of showed a slide where it's, there is no cloud. It's a warehouse somewhere hosting a bunch of servers in a field. Um, and so this happened about a year ago where um, you hear about this once in a while, an Amazon Data Services Center goes down and about a third of the internet stops working that day, which is sort of counterintuitive to the notion of how the internet should work in general. Um, so, and so these, these are things that we have to think about and these are conscious decisions that we have to make. But I will say, sort of from a IIIF implementation standpoint, this has worked out very well for us and it helped us do this in a much shorter period of time than we would have been able to do and it's something that I think we'll be able to build upon for the future and perhaps others as well, so. Thank you and if you have any follow-up questions, please, you know, I'm happy to talk um, anytime. Hello. Um, so I'm here today to tell you about the IIIF implementation that we've recently deployed at the Getty Museum in Los Angeles. Um, we had a slightly different set of considerations, one of which that we, we already had a lot of our images pre-generated, and one of the other things that was part of our conversation early on, we're quite a large organization. There are several different programs. We have Research Institute, a Conservation Institute, the Museum, there's also the Trust. And we decided before we really dived deep into IIIF that we wanted to figure out how we would do this in a consistent way across the organization. And figuring some of those things out is taking a bit longer than um, would maybe be ideal for this particular project. So we've initially implemented a level zero implementation, but I think, uh, uh, just before I get to that, I think it has to be said that the level zero um, almost sounds like you're not doing very much, but it's actually providing probably more than 90% of the functionality of AAAF. And for most users, it's all they'll ever need. And for you, it's a lot less to support. You don't need dynamic image generation. You don't need to scale for that, whether you're doing it on-site or off-site. Dynamic image generation can be an expensive thing to do because you need very powerful systems, potentially if you have a lot of users. Um, and again, there's some edge benefits. And also when IIIF began over six years ago, the browser couldn't do a lot that it can do today. You can do a lot more transformation client-side. It does mean that potentially in those cases, you still have to move potentially a larger image to a client machine to do that rotation or cropping or whatever, but a lot more can now be done client side and that's a way of distributing the costs and pushing them out basically to the user. You're not having to deal with that complexity and support it all yourself. Um, so this is kind of our setup, uh, just to give you a little bit of context to what we've done. We use TMS, we use Open Text Media Manager as our DAM, um, but in front of those systems and between, basically between those systems and everything downstream, we have something called the Digital Object Repository, which pulls in all of our collections data, um, related interpretive media information, like uh, w gallery labels and that kind of thing, exhibition content. And then we, and this stack basically goes back about five years. It's when we first deployed it. Um, and we also have something called the Media Derivative Manager, the MDM. Um, and all of those pieces have been in place and working really well for a number of years, and to, uh, the MDM generates a range of basically pre-generated derivatives, including deep zoom image tile sets, which are scaled at the full resolution of the original TIFF. So there's no, like, we don't scale down before we generate the, the, the deep zoom. 
So those are the highest quality images that we offer. Um, we uh, had a pretty complicated information structure before. We simplified it with the door. Um, I can go into some of the more detail about the door later, but it's built on uh, MySQL and Elasticsearch, feeds in, pulls in information from these source repositories, and then feeds everything downstream. So we already had a place that we could basically insert IIIF. Um, and IIIF basically being another RESTful API. Um, it's kind of one of those cool buzzwords now, right now, and certainly works a lot better than SOAP and some of the other technologies. Um, so we basically added support for IIIF within the door, which also means that every single downstream application now has access to IIIF. Um, if you, it, you don't have to necessarily have a structure as centralized as this. You could just provide you know, a single small web server somewhere that's kind of doing the translation of a IIIF query and then providing some data back in the IIIF standard. You could feed that from any place. Um, and actually, as part of this project, we developed a basically a small code repository that shows you how to go from data to feeding IIIF. Uh, it's all documented, the code's on GitHub, there's a link that I have at the end of the slides. Um, so our goal as well was to include a link to IIIF from our collection pages following the Yale model. Uh, the icons that you'll find are both clickable and you can also drag them into the Mirador viewer, which is kind of a convenient way if you want to compare multiple objects as well from different institutions. You can just kind of drag the image from one browser window into the Mirador viewer and it will open a new panel and then you can explore those images. Um, this is the view of the same object in the Mirador viewer and all of the collections data is coming straight from TMS via the door and then being assembled into a IIIF compatible manifest which is just a JSON file with a particular structure. Um, one of the things that we learned through this process is the IIIF documentation is really thorough and it's really well written and it really clearly explains what to do. However, information on how to do it, how to get from, you know, this is what you should do and this is what the output should look like is in some cases pretty complicated and opaque, particularly regarding Zoom tile sets because the way that the IIIF viewers ask for those images is completely different to how things like the Open Sea Dragon Zoom viewer has worked over the, you know, the, like the last seven or eight years that it's been around, and that's one of the main uh, Zoom tools that people use. And we also realized that sharing our experiences would hopefully be beneficial to the community, because when we started this project, we were looking everywhere for this kind of documentation. It's like, how do we get from, you know, what the documentation's telling us we should do to actually where we need to be to have a working implementation? And that was one of those struggles. And, um, something that hopefully this will help um, bolster. So um, it's also kind of what we've built is a bit of a technical tutorial. It shows you in code how to get to the end result. It's fairly minimal in terms of code. The only, there's a single dependency, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, so that's on this slide. So uh, we basically have developed a standalone IIIF server demo. The URL's at the bottom. It'll also be on the last slide. And I'd be happy to share that with any of you as well after the presentation if you don't get a chance to note it down now. Um, we also, we've supported through this implementation the image API, which basically translates what the viewer is asking for. So say you, if you're looking at a Zoom image, it may ask for a particular tile in a certain way. And then we need to translate that URL from IIIF into basically a mapping to a file on a server. Because at the moment, we are just serving our flat files. But as I said, that's really supporting most people's needs. And it's been successful so far. We haven't had people come and say, hey, I want to be able to rotate the image, or I want to extract this region. They've actually been really happy with having IIIF uh, as it is so far. Um, it only has one dependency, just PHP. Most systems actually have it, even if you don't realize. Macs have it all installed. PCs, it's super easy to install with just like a single download from the PHP website. Um, it's the most popular of the web programming languages. It's been around for a long time. So it's pretty easy also to translate to other code bases if you work in a different language. Um, and it's easily run from the command line. And there's instructions in the repository on how to do that. And the source can be downloaded from the link. Um, so it basically generates a manifest. And what I've done for this demo, rather than obviously having a hook into TMS, is I've just basically have a folder of uh, object information also as a JSON file with a similar structure to the manifest, 
but there are some fields which are slightly different. And I've included a block with uh, related image information. So there's uh, URLs to the image and the size specifications. And that's really important for uh, deep zoom images because translating IIIF requests to, for example, a deep zoom tile URL is reliant on knowing the width and the height of the source image that you've generated the tile set from as well as the tile size and the number of zoom levels that you've also, you also generated at the time that you generated the tile set. So having those pieces of information enables you to do the translations. And as an example, you can see here, um, the top line is a IIIF style URL. Um, the, the number with the at sign in it is basically the first part in this particular example, and it can be anything is uh, the object ID, and then the number after the at sign is the, um, is the image reference. So it's just basically a way of saying to the server, I want this image that relates to this object, um, but the way you structure that part, as long as it's unique and you can reference it back to your database, uh, your database it can be anything that you want. The part afterwards is kind of a region specifier and then a tile size, which in this case is 254 pixels, and that's a fixed number. But that, as you can see, is being, having to be translated to an actual file on disk. So in this case, it's the 239-380 image and then a particular, uh, re, a particular zoom level, in, in this case 12, and a particular XY coordinate. And the code to do that is all included. And that was one of the things that we found really hard to figure out initially and then wanted to contribute back. So I actually built this little demo, which I can quickly show you. Um, oh, I think we closed it, oops. But it's fine. Um, this is all running locally. It's not reliant currently on an internet connection. One of the things that I did though to make the repository a little bit more manageable, I didn't actually include the, the full tile sets, there's several gigabytes worth of data there. So what I've done instead is just put URLs that point to those same images hosted on Getty servers. So the code base itself is really small, but you could also do a demo with your own data set. Say if you have a, a Zoom tile set, you could just have that on your local hard drive, for example, and it, as long as you've referenced it in your JSON, it will work. Um, one of the images that, um, I really like. So there's a, there's a couple of features that, and you, you would get all of this as part of the code. You can view the raw manifest. So this is the metadata that's basically fed the generation of the IIIF manifest. So the structure is similar. I didn't want to make it different just for the sake of it being different. You'd obviously need to do the mapping yourself between, say, TMS and what you need here. Um, but the image piece is something that usually you don't get in this detail in uh, a IIIF manifest because it's all done through the image API instead. But here, because I needed some source information, I decided to provide it in a simple format and just doing a JSON file rather than providing, say, a database or something with this demo. Um, so you can kind of see the nuts and bolts of how it's all put together. Those get converted into uh, the presentation manifest, which is, this is specifically the IIIF uh, format, so you can see the different key value pairs. This is all according to the IIIF documentation, and then, uh, there's a copy of Mirador which comes with this demo. Um, and this is one of our objects. The, all of the metadata is available through the Mirador viewer because we've obviously provided it in the format the viewer expects to find it. And all IIIF compatible viewing tools know how to read those same metadata structure. Um, and this is the full high res image, even down to the cracks in the canvas uh, in the oil, um, being served directly in this particular case off local the local disk, but if you take the demo, it would just be pulling the tiles from the Getty machines. Um, and the code base basically goes through the, all of the different steps in terms of how to get from, you know, this is what we need to where we want to be. So the advantages being that you could basically put this little bit of code, it's a couple of kilobytes on a web server somewhere, it only needs PHP and some source information, which hopefully isn't too hard to script, basically to write a little shim. Um, and then you could be IIIF compatible in, with very little work on you know, not having to invest a great deal of time or money in the process. And it gives you some time to evaluate if you do want to get to the higher levels of implementation, if you actually do feel that dynamic image generation is worth the time and the money, um, or if you actually feel that given 90% or thereabouts of the feature set, if that's actually really supporting your users' needs. And it's certainly 
a lot better potentially than what is currently offered, particularly because of the ability of being able to share your data through this community effort, which also for researchers and scholars and exhibition planners, they can now pull images from our data sets and other institutions collaborating in the IIIF collaborative and have all of those pieces of information in the same viewing tool. They can annotate that information for research purposes or for exhibition planning, and we really didn't have to do that much work. Once we'd figure this piece out, we were in a really good place. So there's some things that we're looking to do in the future, better integration with our search index, um, potential support for level two, but as I say, we were, we're particularly working it out or wanting to work it out at an institutional level, so we do it in a consistent way. We don't want a fragmented range of deployments because that's going to be more, uh, more maintenance and support. And then also looking at some of these other pieces like authentication for some of our protected image assets. And we're looking forward to the discovery APIs, which is one of the pieces the IIIF consortium is working on at the moment, because that's really going to help with finding stuff across institutions. At the moment, we're sort of relying on institutions' existing collections, pages, and search interfaces to find those links to IIIF assets and manifests. Eventually, the hope, I think, is to try and centralize that searchability somehow. Um, but that's still to be determined. So uh, if you have any questions, I'll be here for the rest of the day. Um, please feel free to come up and ask, and thank you. Thanks, Dan. Um, in my 12 minutes, I'm going to address the users. And we have five use cases. I'm Alan Newman, Chief of Digital Media at the National Gallery. So we'll start with um, listing the, the five use cases that you're going to see. Most of them involve uh, Mirador and finding images and uh, comparing them. Um, the first use case is actually live now on our website. So you can, um, we had a soft launch and it seems to be working. So you can play with this either now or later. Uh, we. Um, have a, a means by using our search the collection tools and a little later we'll also um, have this available for browsing um, to select between two and eight images that are related in this case um, a, a painting that Tiepolo did twice and we acquired uh, within 50 years of each other when we first opened and then 50 years later, first from Samuel Cress and then from the Brown Foundation, and Madonna and of the Goldfinch. And, and basically, um, I can do a two minute live demo if we have time after this to show you how this works. But ba basically, uh, we did a collection search. We pulled up these two paintings. We have a little compare icon. We click on the compare icon. It says we're going to compare these two images. And whoops, and I went backwards instead of forwards. And uh, that's what it looks like. And then we've got some controls here, which we can uh, use to pan zoom. And this is uh, what, what we get. So this is a very nice tool that um, a lot of people like to do. Um, we're just showing this now uh, within our own website, but with, this can be used across different websites, as Dan mentioned. Two, this is a Rothko project that we're going to release in the spring. And uh, it's, it's uh, the goal of the, the full project, ready in a couple of years, is uh, all 2,600 works that are known uh, of uh, his works on paper. Um, we, we're going live in the spring with 900 of these paperworks from the gallery's collections. So this is the current interface. We're going to um, revise this uh, somewhat. Uh, this was done by a vendor, Whirligig, and um, he's got um, the same kind of compare built in. So this is uh, the utility that we can get with this implementation. I'm showing you a little more of the Rothko project so you can see we have full provenance. Uh, um, we show the exhibition history complete, a bunch of references, and um, the venues of different exhibitions. So this is actually from one of the exhibitions showing all the individual images that were in that exhibition. So it's, it's pretty complete and pretty cool. 
Uh, the third is a CASA project. It's the history of Academia di San Luca, which was basically started um, in order to showcase the artists uh, that were working. So it was a kind of a, a communication tool uh, among and for artists and for the people who worked with artists. Um, so we, um, this project takes that uh, documentation all in Italian and translates it into English, so it's bi full bilingual. And recently, um, they've decided to add, um, using historical maps, up to about 50 places, in this case the Roman Forum, that are mentioned in, in the correspondence. And we have all these cool maps, and in it, um, what we're showing here is um, a tool, uh, part of the, the um, presentation tool, which allows you to annotate. So there's a, a bunch of different um, uses for the tool. And here's annotating the, the Roman Forum. Here, here's the four different kinds of maps that we're using. I just kind of threw it in there because they're very cool maps. And uh, th this is a close-up of uh, that one. Um, we first started with IIIF thinking we'd use it first for the Stieglitz uh, key set, um, which is the... Uh, just a profound academic work that was published uh, by Abrams, authored by Sarah Greenow, our photography curator, and deals with 1,642 of uh, his, his great prints. And then we realized that, gee, if we're building this for Stieglitz, we can use it on the whole website. So uh, that's how the, the, the web, so we did the website first, and that's, that's live now. Um, in this case, um, Stieglitz, as you probably know, worked in a bunch of different series formats at different times. Um, in this case, the uh, uh, equivalents or Songs of the Sky, as he called them. And so we just demonstrating how easy it is very quickly to compare eight of these things and then zoom in on two that are similar and further zoom. And then finally, conservation space, which um, is a, a, a Mellon-funded project, uh, started as a consortium of uh, seven institutions, and the, the gallery is going full throttle forward with it. Where it's basically designed to um, develop standard uh, do document systems for uh, treatments and all the other kinds of documentation that conservators do so they can exchange with each other and archive uh, that. Uh, so this is what was available to us to show them, uh, to show you. It's uh, dealing with uh, a Jan Steen painting, and it basically takes uh, a painting and um, using Mirador to um, compare the x-ray to the painting and noticing that uh, the gentleman with the basket on his head um, is... Uh, uh, referenced in the x-ray in a different position, so we're showing uh, that. So uh, special thanks to Dave Baudet, who's not here, who's, uh, we're fortunate enough to have a software architect on the Mirador project, who's also our staff member, and he's, he's training um, many of the other people in our IT department, and many thanks to uh, John Gordy for uh, helping me with this presentation. So uh, we have a few minutes for questions, and um, I'm going to just navigate us over to the uh, IIIF website um, so that you'll be able to see some of the wonderful um, tools that they, or resources and links that they have uh, for your future um, exploration, <coughs> if you like. See, three, yeah. uh, three eyes and one F. Catherine, can we mention the meeting? In yes, that's what I was. Good. That's Great. what I was going to do. Super. There we go. So, uh, IIIF.io is the website for the IIIF community. There are all kinds of resources here, including um, links to the Slack channel, the discussion group, all of the things that you need to find out uh, if you want to learn more about IIIF. And I will quickly say that the next. Um, Major community meeting for IIIF is going to be in Washington, D.C., May 21st through 25th. The second day, the 22nd of that meeting, will be um, 
an open um, sort of showcase day where all kinds of wonderful IIIF based projects will be demonstrated and uh, those registration tools will go up pretty soon. So after that, questions, anybody? Yes. Who's here to answer that question? <laughs> yes, and yes, yes. I'm trying to put all these standards Yeah, the, the actual JSON files uh, conform to um, JSON-LD, which is a format use, uh, to use the JSON like file format for linked data. So the structure is there, and the, already the attributes that are needed to connect the dots between different resources. So. Effectively, this is a way to expose uh, image metadata as linked data as well, and it fits in uh, very tightly with, for example, the Linked Art Initiative. One of the main authors of this specification, Rob Sanderson, who was at Stanford and is now at the Getty, has also been working on linked open data for objects as well. So it's all with this mindset of linking everything together and that you would reference, say, a IIIF manifest in a linked way from, say, an object manifest elsewhere. So yes, it does conform to the specifications. Okay. Anybody else? Yes. Yes, they definitely will. We'll 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 uh, submit an updated set of slides to MCN, and um, so yes, as soon as they do, or if you want to get in touch with any of us, we can also share them with you. Yeah. Happy to. Yeah. Catherine, can I, can I mention that the spring meeting, the Tuesday, is also for new users, firstly. And secondly, um, I'm going to be working with Liz Neely at AAM to contact small and medium-sized institutions who want to get involved with IIIF and show a path so you don't necessarily have to invest a lot of money or have huge programming resources just to, to get started. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Oh, and the other thing that I'll just mention quickly in case you don't want to dive into the IIIF website is that there is a museum uh, group within IIIF, and you can join that group. There's a call on the first Tuesday of every month at 11 o'clock in the morning, and um, lots of issues related to new projects in museum work and IIIF are discussed there and shared with, with the community, so everyone is welcome to join. Yes. All right. Well, thank you all.